All right, we are live. We're going to try to stream on the uh, Windows computer today. Maybe make this uh, OBS screen a little bit smaller here. Got to make sure our cats are there. All right, so today we're going to be looking at elucidating the design space of diffusion-based generative models. Um, this is a paper coming out of NVIDIA. So this is the uh, GitHub repo, NV Labs, uh, which is NVIDIA's research uh, division. Starred uh, the main author here, Taro Karas. It's this guy, um, principal research scientist. And if we open up their page, uh, lots of kind of interesting work. This guy's a kind of a lifetime researcher here, computer graphics, rendering, distinguished scientist. So this guy definitely knows his shit. So this is interesting. Uh, talks about diffusion-based generative models, right? Like stable diffusion, really all the, the rage recently. So um, this is a pretty math heavy paper, lots of math here, so it's going to take a second to chew through it, but I think we're going to come out of this with a much greater understanding of um, diffusion models and kind of what the underlying math of this is. Should be cool. We'll see if we can actually get through it because this is going to be thick. Here they have a ton of pictures. All right. So the theory and practice of diffusion-based generative models are unnecessarily convoluted. Um, okay, so they're going to present a design space that separates the concrete design choices. Uh, preconditioning on the score. Okay. Uh, new state of the art FID. We'll figure out what that is later. Uh, CIFAR 10 is uh, actually a really small data set. It's a benchmark data set. It's a um, these little tiny pictures of cats and dogs and horses and ships. 32 by 32 uh, images. Uh, class conditioned, right? So CIFAR is separated into classes such as dog, airplane, and so on. And then there's uh, unconditioned where you don't give it the class. Dramatically improve the efficiency and quality obtainable. Uh, and then also they improve the FID on ImageNet 64. New state of the art 1.36. Okay. Fusion-based generative models. What is the actual paper that they cite for this? Yeah, so this is actually the old... Diffusion models, one of the lower known things about them is that they're actually, they've been a while, around for a while. It's just that they weren't necessarily used. So it's interesting to see him find the original uh, citation for that and not just cite uh, so the stable diffusion are one of these like kind of more popular ones. Although I suspect that's what this is. Okay. Uh, unconditional and conditional. Right. So uh, are you giving the network something, whether it's a class or a prompt, or are you get, and that would be conditional and then unconditional, you're not giving it anything. <laughs> 
yep, these models are kind of exploding. Uh, we were, I think we looked at an audio-based one. Uh, language translation, I would even add 3D uh, object asset creation is kind of the, the biggest application of this probably. Yeah, so maybe I think this is the meat of why this paper might be interesting, where it's saying that the way these models are created a lot, it's it's kind of an accumulation of a bunch of kind of bag of tricks, as you have seen kind of in all these neural network architectures. Generally what happens over the years is that kind of people keep adding these bag of tricks, and then once you get a certain amount of years deep into a particular architecture, people kind of lose track of which of these bag of tricks are actually important, which of them don't matter, and they kind of keep this like baggage, right? They, they just have this like giant tech debt, I don't know if tech debt is the right word, but this accumulated baggage of, of complicated tricks and math and theory that maybe don't necessarily matter, and you're better off just kind of simplifying it and, and making it as simple as possible, and sometimes you even get performance boosts out of that, and I think that's what this paper proposes. better insights, uh, what degrees of freedom are available. Okay, we focus on the broad class of models where a neural network is used to model the score of a noise. <laughs> this is such a formal definition. Is used to model the score of a noise level dependent marginal distribution of the training data corrupted by Gaussian noise. Denoising score matching. So. Yeah, really these generative models, what they're doing, I think this picture shows it the best, but it, it, they're basically going from a noisy image to an unnoisy image. And then if you run that backwards, you can generate images from basically noise. That's the fundamental trick. It's like it's an unblurring is what you're learning, right? You're taking the training data, corrupting it with Gaussian noise, and then the model learns how to unblur that. And then you can just feed it random noise, and the network will unblur it into the stuff that you want. Best performing time discretization for sampling. Okay. Significant drop in the number of sampling steps required. Okay, and then this improved sampler can just be dropped in. Okay, so commonly used network architectures for this is DDPM and NCSN. How old are these? DDPM is 2020. And then NCSN is 2019. Okay, so those are relatively recent. Analysis of the preconditioning of the inputs, outputs, and loss functions. Note that non leaking augmentation, typically used with GANs, is beneficial for diffusion models as well. Okay. Uh, 
our approach will allow for easier innovation on the individual components and thus enable more extensive and targeted exploration of the diffusion of the design space of diffusion models. Okay, so this is going to be where they start going heavy on the math here. So you have some data distribution p data of x, right? So this is in your image space, right? You have all your pixels and those pixels and those images composed of those pixels. Um, there's some distribution that describes how those pixels in that image are, you know. There's some standard deviation for that distribution. I mean, I would say that this uh, deviation, standard deviation is kind of confusing to think about because this is very, very high, high dimensional data. We consider the family of mollified distributions Okay, what is a mollified distribution? Mollifiers are smooth functions with special properties used in distribution theory to create sequences of smooth functions approximating non-smooth functions via convolution. Okay, a mollifier top in dimension one. At the bottom, in red is a function with a corner and sharp jump, and the in blue is a mollified version. Okay, so keyword here I'm seeing is smooth. So uh, convolution, right, is basically taking a, you're taking a pattern and then convolving it across something, right? So everybody knows about convolutions and uh, convnets, right, where you take this this kernel and you kind of multiply it along, or not, right, just kind of stride it along an image. And here they're saying that a mollifier is kind of this this one dimensional thing here and you're convolving it across this axis here on this red function which has sharp peaks. And when you convolve it, of course, you're gonna get a smooth function. So basically it's a form of smoothing. So here's a function undergoing progressive mollification. So why might mollification be important is that you don't have any sharp edges, right? A mollified distribution can, is thus by my kind of understanding of this is something that is kind of smooth and continuous. Okay, obtained by adding Gaussian noise of standard deviation to the data. Okay, Gaussian noise. For, it is practically, okay, so if the standard deviation, the maximum standard deviation is much higher than the standard deviation of the data, the distribute, the mollified distribution with the max standard deviation is practically indistinguishable from pure Gaussian noise. Yeah. I agree with that, right? If your mollified distribution has a huge standard deviation, it's basically just going to be Gaussian noise. The idea of diffusion models is to randomly sample a noise image. Okay, noise image. So the image X naught is sampled from a standard distribution or a Gaussian standard distribution or a Gaussian or a bell curve, whatever you want to call it, centered around zero with uh, a standard deviation of this one, sigma max, and sequentially denoise it into images xi. Yeah, so this is what we were describing before, where really what these Gaussian, or really what these uh, diffusion models are doing is you take a, a noisy image like this, right? and then you iteratively, step by step, turn it into the image that you want, right? Sequentially denoise it into images x sub i, right? Where i is the uh, number of steps here. 
uh, noise levels. Okay. So the, at the final point, right, you want uh, standard deviation of zero. So the, the noise at the very end, you, should, you ideally want no noise. And at the very beginning, you have your maximum noise. And at each individual step, the image I is drawn from a distribution of that image I and that uh, standard deviation on the Gaussian noise. Stochastic differential equation. Both removes and adds noise at each iteration. Okay. Okay, so there's some differential equation that I guess maintains or describes the distribution of the images as the sample, right? So there's some distribution here. That's what they call that, the SDE that represents that. And then there's a different differential equation, which they call the probability flow. Uh, where the only source of randomness is the initial noise image. So the only source of randomness is the very first image. Okay. Probability flow ODE continuously increases or reduces noise levels of the image when moving forward or backward in time. Okay, so it's noising and denoising. Okay, there's some schedule. How do you change the uh, standard distribution of the Gaussian noise over time? Desired noise level at time t. I don't know if I would call this time, I would call it step, right? Because there's discretization into steps, it's not a continuous time. Although maybe that's uh, maybe that's the whole point here is that they need to make it continuous so that they can differentiate it. Sample setting sigma t to the square root of t. Okay. As it corresponds to constant speed heat diffusion. So This is kind of an interesting way to think about it. So differential equations are, at least in my background, kind of from a physics background, you can use them to describe kind of heat flowing through a system, right? Like how does heat transfer from one object to a different object outside of water, something like that. And the way that heat diffuses through a system, right? is this way, squared, square root, right? It's these uh, proportional to the squared as like, at, and there's a lot of natural systems that have that kind of squared behavior. So they're calling it mathematically natural, which I think is a good way of describing just a bunch of things, right? Like the, the, the choice of the prior for Gaussian noise, right? Like why, why do we, choose this distribution right like what is magical about this like bell shape and really the only thing that's magical about it is that if you plot a bunch of things in real life such as uh, the height of a human or the average size of a tree or you know all these random things in life have this kind of bell-shaped curve right 
So nature itself has these kind of repeatable patterns. So here they're saying, okay, we're going to pick, what type of noise are we going to pick? Well, we're going to pick Gaussian noise because that's a pattern that comes up in nature all the time, right? It's mathematically natural. And okay, why are, why are we uh, choosing this uh, schedule for our noise based on square root? Because we see that all the time, right? That's what happens when you diffuse heat. So we're just going to choose that. And uh, yeah, I can, this is kind of on theme with this paper, right? Where they're saying that whenever this was chosen in whatever original paper, uh, this one here, 12. Wow. <laughs> Look at that. This is a 1822 paper by the original Fourier. That is, that is badass. That's a badass reference right there. Um, but that's original heat diffusion, but they're saying whoever chose to use this for the ODE formulation, right? And whatever machine learning paper, they didn't necessarily need to choose that. So they're saying that the choice of the schedule has major practical implications and should not be made on the basis of theoro theoretical convenience. So yeah, they're saying you can actually pick something different for that. And depending on what you pick, it's actually going to come out quite different. So looking forward to that. Um, evolving a sample X of A. Uh, let's highlight this so we can go back. From time TA to TB yields a sample X of B. Okay. This requirement is satisfied by, okay, so dx, the change in x, is the uh, negative dot, so dot is a uh, time derivative, right? So this is the, the derivative of the uh, standard deviation of the Gaussian noise over time, right? So it's going to be basically the derivative of this, square root of t. Derivative of square root of t is derivative of square root of x is 1 half x to the negative 1 half. So right, derivative of the square root of t would be 1 over 2 square root of t, or just 1 over square root of t times sigma t again, which is square root of t, but the reason they're they're using it, the actual schedule here is that they're gonna replace it. It's not always gonna be square root of t, it's gonna be other things. So they're putting in a general formulation here. Times uh, this, which is curl, uh, curl function. Uh, right? I don't know if that's actually Nabla. When applied to a function defined on a one dimensional domain, it denotes the standard derivative of the function as defined in calculus. Okay, so this means the derivative with respect to x of the log of the distribution, right? And why do people uh, do uh, logs? Well, because the derivative of log x, look at this the derivative the derivative of log of x is just 1 over x times the log of that number which you can just calculate so a lot of times when you see these logs the reason they're doing that is cuz it's it, it's easy to differentiate the the solution to the derivative of that is clean right it's exact you can write it in a program and it doesn't take a bunch of time to compute um so 
Okay, you had log of the probability distribution of that image and the standard deviation uh, schedule noise over time, uh, dt, dx. So dx dt. So right, you bring that dt over to this side, and you say the the change in dx dt, the derivative of x with respect to time, is that. Uh, they're calling this part here the score function. A vector field that points toward higher density data at a given noise level. Right. So when you take the derivative of the distribution of x with some noise with respect to x, uh, you're going to get a vector field, right? So think of it like uh, uh, there was a picture here. So th this is a vector field, right? And in this space, which of course is high dimensional, so it's not 2D like this, so it's it's difficult to visualize, but it points towards uh, a higher density of data. So there's more kind of uh, more Im more stuff there, more image there. Infinitesimal forward step of this ODE nudges the sample away from the data and at a rate that depends on the change in noise level. A backward step nudges the sample towards the data's distribution. Okay, so this is basically the explicit noising and denoising is what's it's what's happening here. The noise score function has the remarkable property that does not depend on the generally intractable normalization constant of the underlying density function. What the fuck does that mean? Generally intractable normalization constant. So this probability distribution of images and uh, the standard deviation. So let's if we go into two dimensional space, right? Let's say this was height and weight of a human, right? Each human, there would be a little dot there, and it, and if you had uh, hundreds of thousands of humans, there would be parts of this two dimensional space that have high high uh, density and parts that have low density, right? And the same is true for this image space this data distribution in image space. There's parts of that, right? There's in this high dimensional image space, there's some area with cats and there's a ton of density there, right? There's a ton of images with cats. There isn't a ton of images with cats that have four eyes, right? So that would be a lower density area of this uh, multi-dimensional space on which this distribution sets. So the density of that space Right. If I, if we go back to our to our human, if there's ten humans, right, to normalize it, you divide it kind of by ten. But you don't know what the normalization constant is for something in image space, right? It's like, what does that even mean? So I think that's kind of what they're saying here, and they're saying it's interesting that we don't need to know, we don't need to normalize this, uh, the density, the the basically the probability distribution here. Right. We don't need to know what the highest peak is in that density, or what the highest peak of that probability distribution is. Right. Because, for example, the uniform distribution, not uniform, uh, normal distribution. Right. The area under this is 1. Right, so in order to get that all to sum to one, right, you need to know how high this is, right? There's a normalization there of like, okay, the, in order for this all to sum to one, this is at 0.4, the highest peak. You don't know what that is there, right? This still needs to all add up to one, but 
you don't know what the normalization constant is there. Okay, so now they're introducing a denoiser function. Um, minimizes the expected L2 denoising error. Uh, y is a training image, N is noise. Slight the score function isolates the noise component from the signal in X. Figure one illustrates the behavior of ideal D in practice. Uh, the key observation in diffusion models is that D can be implemented as a neural network. Yeah, so this denoising function. You make it a neural network and then you differentiate across a bunch of, or you take a bunch of backprop over a ton of training examples and then the neural network is a magical function approximator that actually works quite well. So this is what they call this preconditioning. Okay, so there's some stuff you can do as part of this uh, uh, denoiser function. Okay, let's say, let's look at this uh, equation here, two comma three. So this is equation two and then equation three, that's, that's what that means there. So the expected value of y, which is the training image, which is drawn from the distribution of uh, the data distribution. And then you have here the noise, which is right just drawn from a normal distribution. Um, this is the uh, denoised uh, training image plus noise. Uh, at the uh, the noise or standard deviation, right? And this is a schedule, so this is scheduled. So over time, this is going to change this sigma here. And uh, you're denoising the image plus the noise, and then you're subtracting the image, or not subtracting, but basically just looking at how close that is. So taking the L squared. So the further away these are the bigger the error is, right? That's what the square does. That's what the L2 uh, loss is all about. It's basically penalizing the further away two things are, right? Linear L1 error penalizes linearly. So like being this far away gives you one, being this far away counts as uh, two versus L squared being this far away is one, being this far away is four, right? Because it squares the difference. Okay, uh, so they have this expected value of the L2 loss. And then here they have the, uh, this is what, they, what were they calling it here? The score function, right? Which is the log of the distribution is equal to the denoising function uh, minus x, so L1, over that squared, sigma squared. I don't know exactly how they got this, but... Hmm. So they said figure one here denoising score matching on CIFAR-10. Images from the training set corrupted with varying levels of additive Gaussian noise. So you start with images from the training set, right? These come from CIFAR-10, a little 32 by 32 image of an airplane, a little 32 by 32 image of a truck. And then you're going forward, right? Your noise is, uh, you're, you're increasing that, which increases the amount of noise which is Gaussian, and you can see how when you add the image X plus the noise, right, that's what's going on here, right, 
training image Y, and then you're simply just adding the noise. Then over 50 steps, right, you're just going to go to just complete noise. This is just indistinguishable from a Gaussian distribution. High levels of noise lead to oversaturated colors. We normalize the images for a clean, cleaner visualization. Yeah, so because the noise is additive, you're going to basically, you keep adding the pixel values to each other. So you normal you want to normalize the images uh, so that they don't just kind of all end up at RGB equals 255, 255, 255. Optimal denoising result from minimizing equation two analytically. Yeah, so really, this is what you mo. This is what you really want, right? This, if you have kind of additive Gaussian noise very quickly, it just looks like nothing. And right, that's kind of what they're showing you here. Within kind of two steps, you're already gone. But really, what they want is more, more of a kind of a blurring effect right? You don't want additive Gaussian noise. You probably want uh, that first word that they dropped at, that we looked up. What was it? Mulled or mulling or whatever. Mollified, right? You want to convolve this with a mollification or mollified, mollifier, whatever you want to call it, right? And then just blur it out, right? So you want Gaussian blur, not additive Gaussian noise. Some methods introduce an additional scale schedule S of T. Okay. And consider X S of T X hat to be a scaled version of the original non-scaled variable X. This changes the time dependent probability density and consequently also the ODE solution trajectories. We explicitly undo the scaling. Okay, so I think this might be they, they make the images smaller and then bigger. I'm not 100% sure what scaling means in this context. Right, and then because I guess the way the reason why they're doing this is that uh, they want to make it generic, right? They're, they're saying, here's the basic math, but rather than assuming uh, the, the noise over time changes with square root of T, and there's some scaling that happens, we're instead going to like say these things themselves are just random functions or, or just arbitrary functions, and then we actually write out the, OD, the differential equation, assuming that we don't actually know what these functions are, right? And that'll give us a general solution or a general equation that we can then plug in our own choice for S of T and Sigma of T. Uh, the ODE to be solved is obtained by substituting equation three into equation four. So this is equation three. You substitute this term here, uh, right here, the score function. Here you know it's a it's a function of this denoiser, the image, and the sigma. So they're saying take this equation three, plug it in here for this, and the solution can be found by numerical integration. Uh, finite steps over discrete time intervals. Yeah, so yeah. So if you want to integrate right this function here, 
y x there's some area under this curve you it might be difficult or i guess you can write out the equation for it but in in a computer right how do you actually calculate that number and get an exact version of that and what you can do is numerical integration where you're saying okay let me split this up into some into tiny little uh, bars right so i'm i'm taking like infinitesimally small little steps and then i'm adding them all up so that's what they're saying here is that uh, you can't really get the solution to this exactly, but we can uh, find it. Uh, we can get a numerical solution to it by dividing, by taking tiny little steps over some tiny discrete time interval. This requires choosing the integration scheme. Okay, so there's a couple different ways of doing this, and then some discrete sampling times. T0 all the way to Tn. Uh, we show in section 3 that a second order solver offers a better computational trade-off. Okay, so they're saying that most people just use Euler's method to calculate this or do this integral, but there you can use some other methods here that are a little bit better. Table 1 represents formulas for reproducing deterministic variants of three earlier methods in our framework. These methods were chosen because they are widely used and achieve state-of-the-art performance, but also because they were derived from different theoretical foundations. Yeah. Any choices within reason for the individual formulas will lead to a functioning model. So this is kind of really the, the point that we're making at the very beginning. We're like, hey, there's a lot of choices that were kind of randomly made, and then people are just kind of carrying this baggage along, and they don't necessarily need to do that. And we can actually define all, we can actually work through all of the math and not have explicit definitions for what this sigma t is or what this uh, scaling s of t or scale schedule s of t so we're gonna basically say these can be anything and then let's figure out how it changes let's choose different uh, versions of them and see what happens okay so here we have uh, different versions of diffusion models, uh, design choices employed by different model families. N is the number of ODE solver iterations. Okay. The corresponding sequence of time steps, right? So this is basically the amount of uh, individual steps you take, uh, where at the end you're at time zero. If the model was originally trained for specific choices of n and ti, the originals are, cho are denoted by m and uj. The denoiser is defined as, yep, this is parameterized by your, this is the neural network, parameterized by some parameters theta, c skip x plus c out f, what is f? f represents the raw neural network layers. Okay, so here we have different versions of diffusion models. Uh, this is theirs, the EDM one, um, and this is some previous ones, which is this. Stochastic differential equation, so I don't know. I hate these acronyms. It's hard to know exactly what is what. Uh, so section three, we have the ODE solver. What are you using to solve? the uh, time steps, uh, the choice of the scheduling function, the choice of the scaling. So we see here some pretty complicated expressions here with these betas, which are probably hyperparameters, beta d, beta min, that you have to tune. Uh, in EDM, they just the schedule is just t, and the scaling is just 1. There's no scaling. We can see how uh, these other ones also use that simple one. Um, ODE solver, it seems like everybody's using this Euler 
method, but uh, here in the EDM, I think they'll describe this later, but they call it, they use this uh, second order uh, solver. And then time steps ti, uh, where i, ti less than or equal to n, where n is the last step, right? Um, okay, so here the time step is based on the min and the max noise. Um, I don't know what this p is here. I think it's rho, right? What is that? Rho Greek alphabet. Yeah. It's Rho. I don't, they don't explain that. Okay, we're going to see these later. But uh, they say the architecture you choose for the raw neural network, right? They say, okay, well, you hear these people are picking DDPM, right? Let's see if we can see a little network diagram for that. Denoising diffusion probabilistic models. Okay, so DDPM also apparently means desert tactical gear. <laughs> um, Okay, so this is just like a, what is this? And then lab ML view code on GitLab, GitHub. Lab ML.ai deep learning paper implementations. Huh, this is pretty cool. So this is like the actual equations and then the lines of code that represent it. Very cool. That's actually pretty badass. I've never seen this. What is labml.ai? Tools to help deep learning researchers. Let me follow that. Our website. Monitor deep learning model training and hardware usage. Annotated PyTorch paper implementation. So it's kind of like a weights and biases clone. Interesting. Okay. Skip scaling. Okay. Output scaling. These are uh, preconditioning, but basically. Uh, that's what they call, let me see what they say. Yeah, so the denoising may include additional pre and post processing steps. So these are the pre and post processing steps. So you can scale the input, scale the output, uh, skip scaling. I don't know what that means. Maybe that means every certain amount of time you scale or something. Uh, noise conditioning. So condition on the noise itself. So you can see how many of these previous works were kind of just carrying over from this original work. So right here in this work, they pick different uh, different functions for those. Right, we see here like an average of the noise. Noise distribution. Here we have uniform noise. Uniform, uniform, uh, weighting the losses. Here we have normal noise. And then you have these hyperparameters. Okay, so that was, these were uh, random hand-tuned hyperparameters here. And here they have the hyperparameters for here as well. So, I mean, I don't know, this still seems kind of bad, right? It's like you still have a bunch of hand-tuned crap here.
Section 3, improving the output quality and or decreasing the computational cost of sampling. These are basically the kind of the two main levers that you can improve this technology on, right? So because uh, to go in this case, you're, you're this is kind of the training. You go, you add noise, and then in the inference, you remove the noise. But for these diffusion models, inference is not like a one-shot thing, right? Inference is a series of steps, right? So each, the time it takes to go from step seven to six, six to five, five to four, like if you can reduce that amount of time, right? If you can reduce the computational cost of that, then the whole process can be much faster. Choices related to the sampling process are largely independent, such as network architecture and training details. Okay, so they're saying you can actually, the choice of sampler does not depend uh, on the denoising function. So they're gonna try a bunch of different samples on different denoising models that are pre-trained. Um, they evaluate a couple different models on CIFAR 10. corresponding to the variance preserving and variance exploding formulations of 49. This is what FID is, Frechette Inception Distance. I think we've actually stumbled across that um, before and it's basically a metric that allows you to kind of get a number uh, that compares the uh, real images and generated images and it's a way to kind of determine quality of the images generated I think it's sometimes used in GAN literature Original samplers, so this is figure two. Original deterministic samplers are shown in blue and the re-implementation of these methods is orange. Yield similar but consistently better results. Okay. So FID, so it's a distance metric, right? So the bigger it is, the more uh, the real images and the generated images are further away from each other. So the smaller it is, the better your image generation quality is. So you want this to go down. Um, this is the original samplers in the uh, papers. And then they're saying this is our re-implementation. So for each of these uh, different uh, models, we're going to change the sampler and see what happens. This is uh, their second order ODE solver. Um, and then this is their Wow, these two colors are very, very similar. This is the extra stuff they did too, where you can change the uh, noise uh, over time function and the uh, scaling over time function. So blue takes a bunch of extra, you, know, you can see how blue kind of takes a bunch of extra time to get to the a bunch of extra steps to get to a low FID versus their uh, re-implementation gets there much quicker. Surprisingly, actually, it seems like the most 
uh, performance juice is squeezed by using their uh, sigma t and s of t. That's where they're getting really most of it. Solving an ODE numerically is necessarily approximation of the following, of following the true solution trajectory. At each step, the solver introduces truncation error. Okay. So because you're numerically solving this ordinary differ this uh, differential equation, you're going to be accumulating error uh, over the steps. Uh, and increasing the number n improves the accuracy of solution because the error uh, is dependent on the step size, right? So that's kind of what they were saying here. When you do numerical integration, you want to you're taking finite steps over discrete time intervals. So in a mathematically ideal world, you'd be taking an infinite number of infinitely small steps but you can't actually do that in the real world because you need to actually compute something with a computer and you actually need to have numbers. So instead you're gonna take hopefully a large number, large number n of very, very small step sizes. So the Euler's method is the ODE solver that uh, all these other people were using, right? So up here in this, uh, right, Euler, 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 and then they, here in this paper, they use this Hune second order solver. ODE solver with O of H squared level error with respect to step size H. Okay, so squared local error. So the error squares scales super linearly. So super linearly is just another way of saying more than linear. So O of H would be linear. O of H squared, super linear. Um, higher order Runge-Kutta methods scale more favorably, but require more evaluations of D sig D per step. We have found Hune's second order method, which is a variant of Runge-Kutta improved Euler trapezoidal rule. Previously explored in the context of diffusion models in 24. Okay, so there was some people that actually proposed this. This this guy did really good literature deep dive. Like they, they really did a, a, a deep analysis of this this guy I'm gonna follow him we're already following him this guy's badass introduces an additional correction step to account for change in dxdt Correction leads to even more superlinear. Is it supra or super? Superlinear local error at the cost of one additional evaluation of d of the denoiser per step. Time step determine how the step sizes and thus truncation errors are distributed between different noise levels. Concluding that the step size should decrease monotonically with decreasing noise and does not need to vary on a per sample basis. We adopt a parameterized scheme where the time steps are defined according to a sequence of noise levels. Okay, so this is the uh, function that they're using to determine the sigma here. For sigma, for all of the sigma 
uh, at a specific time ti that is less than n, right, which is time equals zero at the, at the very end of the inference or at the very beginning of the training, uh, is going to be some constant a times i plus some constant b, right, and then the rho, which is another constant. So constants a and b, and then also uh, rho is also some random mass constant that they choose. Uh, P equals 7. Wow, that's kind of a weird choice of P. Uh, and they want to pick them such that the uh, sigma at the 0 is the time step and sigma at the n minus 1 is the minimum, minimum and maximum. Rho controls how much the steps near sigma min are shortened at the expense of the longer steps near sigma max. Yoon's method reaches the same for shit inception distance as Euler's method with considerably lower NFE. Uh, neural function evaluations. All right, so inference, inferences. Trajectory curvature and a noise schedule. The shape of the ODE solution trajectories is defined. Uh, okay. Yep, these are the two choice, the choice of these functions. Offers a way to reduce the truncation errors discussed above. Uh, can be expected to scale proportionally to the curvature. The best choice for these functions is T and 1, which is also the choice. With this choice, ODE simplifies to that, and sigma and t become interchangeable. Yeah, so that's kind of what they we were talking about this before, but they went through the trouble of uh, dictating or d describing this differential equation without choosing what s of t and sigma of t is, and then they go ahead and they just tell you actually the best values for these is just t. Sigma t equals t and s of t equals 1. Just kind of seems like uh, they, <laughs> they built up all this thing just to tear it down, right? If like everybody, if the choice for these is just t and 1, then like why, the, why all this extra crap where you like, right? It's like to me, it's like it's only worth kind of describing and spending all the time deriving these things in a general way if you're going to pick something tricky for this, right? You're going to pick something tricky for sigma, you're going to pick something tricky for s of t, but if you're just going to pick t and 1, that kind of seems like a, you're missing out on an opportunity there, right? At any t, x and t, at any image x and time t, a single Euler step to t equals zero yields the denoised image. The tangent of the solution trajectory therefore always points towards the denoiser output. So corresponds to the largely linear solution trajectory. So, right, the or differential equation describes a vector field. And you're, really what you're doing when you're denoising is you're taking a path through this vector field, right? So, uh, C 
So this is a path through a vector field. This is another path through a vector field. Um, wait up, I need to answer a door. I'll be back. Sorry about that. Um, let's get back to it. Okay, a 1D ODE sketch in figure 3C supports the intuition. Variance preserving ODE. Okay, so this is the trajectory, right? So you can see that um, this is the tangent line, right? And they're saying that the trajectories are linear versus here they are not. So this is t, so time at time t equals zero. And then uh, so when you're training, you're basically starting with the image and then diffusing it out. When you're performing inference, you you want to start, you want to pretend that the image was diffused and then go backwards from there. Um, X here is just a one-dimensional X, but really X would be image space. The effect of setting sigma t to t and s of t to 1 is shown as red curves in figure 2. So again, this is just one dimensional where the distribution of data is two direct peaks at plus and minus one. All right, so Dirac delta function, right, is just a function that has a very high peak at a specific point. So in one dimensional space, a uh, Right, there's just going to be a peak at uh, one and negative one. That's why they're uh, magnifying it here, right? Because you should, all no matter where you start, uh, from the noise, right? You should basically always end up going back to one and negative one because in this one-dimensional distribution for x, there's only basically two possible values. There's basically one or negative one. So um, here they're showing that. Uh, with their ODE, the the path is much more linear, right? It's like you're you're kind of going straight to the one or the negative one versus here with the variance preserving ODE, ODE or the variance exploding ODE, you can kind of take these like long curvy paths, and it's not not just the curviness and the time it the, like extra time it takes to move there, but it's also the fact that if you actually look here, for example, the uh, the tangent line at this uh, this slope here, right, it actually points away from negative one, right? So if you took a step in this direction, you'd actually end up further away from where you want to go versus here, the tangent kind of always points towards the uh, negative one and one, which is the distribution of this data. Horizontal T is chosen to show sigma, okay. Yeah, 
as sigma goes to zero, the trajectories become linear and point towards the data manifold. Uh, give me another second here. Sorry about that. Uh, high quality results, blah, blah, blah. They can generate high quality images per second on a single NVIDIA V100. So this really doesn't mean anything. CIFAR 10 is a 32 by 32 image and an NVIDIA V100 is absolutely massive. So you're generating the smallest possible image on the biggest possible GPU. So I think there's probably uh, a lot of room to, to go or to improve that in terms of speed. Deterministic sampling. However, it tends to lead to worse output quality than stochastic sampling and injects fresh noise into the image in each step. Okay. So, rather than adding a consistent noise, why don't we add a random noise, right? Stochastic. Sum of probability flow, time variant, Langevin diffusion deterministic noise decay so they're adding a bunch of extra stuff here the image changes over time uh, by adding this noise but then they also add this extra stuff here Langevin diffusion where Omega T is the standard Wiener process. DX plus, DX minus are now separate differential equations for moving forward and backward in time. By the time reversal formula of Anderson. The Langevin term can be seen as a combination of deterministic score based denoising term and a stochastic noise injection term. Whose net noise level contributions cancel out. So this, these cancel out. As such, B of T effectively expresses the relative rate at which existing noise is replaced with new noise.
this is extremely dense. Okay, I kind of feel like this is kind of the, the end of it. The optimal amount of stochasticity should be determined empirically, so. We're gonna add some random ass noise here, and we're gonna determine it through uh, just trying things. Trying things, writing them down, and then trying new things. That's really what empirically means. churn of adding and removing noise. At each step i, the sample xi at noise level t, i, we perform two substeps. First, we add noise to the, sam to the sample according to a factor to reach a higher noise level. Okay. Second, from the increased noise sample, we solve the ODE backwards from t i to t i plus 1 with a single step. This yields a sample xi plus 1 with noise level ti plus 1, and the iteration continues. This is not a general purpose solver, but a sampling procedure tailored for the specific problem. Its correctness stems from the alternation of two substeps that each maintain the correct distribution. Okay, so our stochastic sampler with sigma t equals t and s of t equals 1. So the stochastic sampler has the denoiser. It has, uh, oops, sorry, it has the uh, time. It has uh, whatever this is, gamma i which is different for each step. And then it has some uh, S noise. So first, they sample uh, the first image, x0, from uh, noise, all right, and again the because normally you would pick sigma. This would be the sigma of that noise, but because sigma t equals sigma t equals t, just put t zero in there. And then for each step, so however many steps you have, big N uh, zero indexed, you're going to sample. Uh, some epsilon. This is uh, constant. It does not depend on the step. So you're going to sample some noise from this constant noise distribution. Okay, this gamma here, they tell you what it is here. Gamma is normally zero, but if you're, it's the minimum of these two things here where there's some, I don't know what that capital S is. Uh, first thing you do is you get the next time, the, or no, the T hat. Oh, okay, they're doing like a small step. They're doing like a fake step and then going back and doing the real step. Okay, so they're saying, okay, we're going to make a, a fake step here that is basically the current time or a fake, the, the kind of little look ahead time that is the current time plus some gamma times the current time. And then we're going to also do like a little look ahead. We're going to take our current image. We're going to take a little step. Ooh. This is really hard to highlight. We're going to take a little step that is uh, ti, squ ti hat squared minus ti squared times this epsilon. So we're basically a little bit of noise. Then uh, we're going to subtract the diffuse or the denoised x, right? Feed the little 
delta, the, the little step here in time and in image space. We're going to denoise it. Uh, we're going to compare it to the actual image. We're going to divide by the little time step that we took. This is going to give us D. Right, so select temporarily increased noise level TI. Add new noise to move from TI to TI. TI hat. Evaluate DXDT at TI hat. All right, that's what they're doing here. And then they're taking a Euler step from TI hat to TI plus one. And uh, this is the second order correction. So this is uh, not just Euler's method, but the second order correction of Euler's method. So Euler's method GIF. This is a GIF of Euler's method, right? You're taking the derivative at the point, and then Euler's method second order correction. Maybe there's a video that we can look at. Okay, but the second order correction, basically you calculate the, the second derivative and then that allows you to get a more accurate step. Okay, interesting. So basically they're saying that if you compare this method to the Euler method, right, if you take a lot of very small steps, then it's basically the same and you're doing all this extra crap for no reason. But if you want to reduce the amount of inference, right, neural function evaluations, the amount of times you evaluate this denoising function and take bigger steps, now adding this intermediate noise kind of in between each step actually matters in training. Yeah, so adding this kind of randomness or this extra noise in the training uh, is effective in correcting the errors made by earlier sample step, but it has its own drawbacks. Excessive addition and removal of noise in, results in a gradual loss of detail. There's also a drift towards oversaturated colors at very low and high noise levels. We address the drift towards oversaturated colors by only enabling stochasticity within a specific range of noise levels. Okay. Uh, this is their hyperparameter S churn. We further clamp gamma to never so gamma i is basically just the churn divided by the step size. Finally, I've found that the loss of detail can be partially counteracted by setting s noise slightly above 1 to inflate the standard deviation for the newly added noise.
Huh, this is interesting. Okay, so the hypothesized uh, the denoiser has a tendency to remove too much noise and the reason for this is a regression towards the mean that can be expected with any L2 trained denoiser. So right we were talking about how L2 loss versus L1 loss. L2 loss is more strict, more harsh when it comes to penalizing the difference between uh, 1x and the target x, right? The target and the predicted. So they're saying that because it's trained with L2 loss, this denoiser has a tendency to remove too much noise. Yep, our stochastic sampler outperforms previous samplers, especially at low step counts. Yeah, we had to find optimal values on a case by case using grid search. I wonder what they used. Newly written code base. Okay, here's examples of what they did. PyTorch 110, CUDA 11, CUDA NN 8. eight Tesla V100 GPUs, so these were trained on some big boys. Augmentation pipeline. Model is conditioned with a nine dimensional input vector. So they have some X flipping, Y flipping, scaling, rotations, translations. Okay. Let's get back to the meat here. Preconditioning and training. Yeah, so whenever you train neural networks, you want to make sure to normalize the uh, input and output. Training. Yeah, this is what we were talking about before. The additive Gaussian noise uh, magnitude varies immensely depending on noise level. So you need to normalize. Okay, they're saying the way you do this is with a different network. Uh, this is kind of what I would have guessed is that there's some normalization that happens beforehand that's dependent on that sigma.
we propose to precondition the neural network with a sigma dependent skip connection. Okay, so their denoiser neural net has uh, some skip connection that is only that is dependent on sigma times the image. Right, C skip modulates the skip connection. C in and C out scale the input and output magnitudes. Okay, so you have some scaling functions. C out, C in, C noise, and C noise maps noise level. Taking a weighted expectation of equation two over the noise level gives the overall training loss. Okay, so there's some weight here that is also dependent on sigma. Okay, so they're here they're basically doing something similar to what they did in um previously where they said, hey, rather than kind of just the way you would approach this normally, where you say, okay, well, we want the inputs and outputs and all the stuff to kind of have a univariance, scale it before we feed it in, and we just pick some way to scale it and go forward. They're saying, hey, rather than just saying we pick some way to scale it, let's write out all the equations with explicitly saying this is what we're using to scale the input, this is what we're using to scale the output, this is the term that's dependent on sigma and so on. And then that allows you to write it all out. And once you write it all out, then you can pick what you want to pick. You can pick the choice, right? You can pick what you want for C out, what you want for C in, what you want for C noise. And as with everything else here, I'm going to guess that they're going to pick specific versions of those and show that their choices are better. Determine suitable choices for the precondition functions from first principles. Uh, okay, so this is data sets here, CFAR 10, FFHQ, AFHQ. Uh, training configuration. So these are the different conditional, unconditional. So are they conditioning it on the skip connection is what conditions it, right? So they're adding that. So basically, I think this is a skip connection, no skip connection. Mm. Neural function evaluations. So this is how many times you perform inference. It's 35, 79 steps, 35 steps. And you're kind of seeing the result of, this is kind of like an ablation here. Preconditioning, loss function, non-leaky leaky augmentation. Okay, they do some hyperparameter modification, changing the uh, number of layers uh, in the 
fully connected network that they're using. The main benefit of our preconditioning is that it makes the training more robust, enabling us to turn our focus on redesigning the loss function without adverse effects. Equation 8, this one here, shows that training F theta, the, a, a neural network that is inside the denoiser, uh, incurs an effective per sample loss weight. To balance the effective loss weights, we set Uh, 1 over C out, which equalizes the initial training loss over the entire sigma range. All right, so because we're conditioning uh, this neural network F of theta on uh, stuff that depends on sigma, right? Sigma changes over time, so we want to basically weigh this loss also on sigma so that you're not your loss function isn't like tiny at the beginning and huge at the end or huge at the end and tiny at the beginning whichever way it works out so it kind of equalizes the initial training loss over time in the entire training Figure 5a. Figure 4. Where's figure 5a? Yeah, so you can see as sigma increases over time, it goes from something like 0.005 to 50. Uh, you don't want the loss to be super different, so different magnitudes, so uh, they keep it the same. This is the S churn parameter that they choose. A significant reduction is possible only at intermediate noise levels, at very low levels. It's difficult and irrelevant to discern the vanishingly small noise component. dramatic improvement in FID. Prioritize noise levels that are most relevant with respect to forming the perceptually recognizable content of an image. Yeah, so these small data sets tend to overfit, so they're going to basically uh, augment, uh, where you basically apply a bunch of random flipping, rotating. So you, you take these little images of the trucks, right, and planes, such as Let's go all the way back up here, this little image of a plane, and then you would feed it here where it's pointed to the left, you would randomly flip it to the right, so now it's pointed to the right. So it's a, it's kind of a way of uh, increasing the amount of training data you have because these transformations do not change the uh, actual content of the image. To prevent the augmentations from leaking into the generated images, we provide the augmentation parameters as a conditioning input to F theta. During inference, we set them to zero to guarantee that only non-augmented images are generated. 
So this is interesting. That means that you could, there's a, a conditioning input to this network where you could give it a, you can tell it to basically either flip it left or flip it right, which is kind of cool. It's like allows you to control the generation a little bit more. Yeah, and data augmentation is a great way to improve the state of the art. Okay, so this is interesting. At least they're able to admit, but this stochastic sampling seems like it's actually detrimental. You're better off just the deterministic sampling. And that's on CIFAR 10 too, so I imagine that as the images get bigger and you're taking more steps to be anyways, it actually works out fine. More diverse data sets. Okay, so maybe not. Maybe if you do have bigger, more complicated data sets, you do want this stochastic sampling. So this is kind of how they're picking their S churn, which defines the stochastic sampling, right? So S churn of zero, uh, improves the Frechet inception distance. And Frechet inception distance, right? Remember, lower is better. So when you actually have no stochastic sampling, you get a better score. Um, then when you have high stochastic sampling, but a little bit of stochastic sampling is actually better than the no stochastic sampling. Uh, on ImageNet, right, so CIFAR 10 is a, a simpler data set than ImageNet. ImageNet a little bit more complicated, a little bit larger, a little bit more diversity. Uh, stochastic sampling of zero, you get a worse score. Right, you get a higher Frechet inception distance than if you have a little bit of stochastic sampling. Putting diffusion models to a common framework. Yeah, that's kind of the problem with CIFAR and these smaller things is that you you can do kind of these big grid searches over all the hyperparameter space. You can train them faster. You can actually like explore more things, but then the sometimes the conclusions you draw from them don't necessarily mean anything because once you go to bigger data sets, more complicated data distributions, it's not you're not really getting any it might be different dynamics are at play and all the stuff that you learned on this smaller data set no longer applies.
how much is 250 megawatt hours? Megawatt hour of average household. Annual uh, electricity consumption of a U.S. residential utility customer is 10,715. So 10,715 kilowatt hours to megawatt hours is 10 megawatt hours. So 250 megawatt hours is roughly 25 households. So it's roughly 25 houses over one year is what they burned on this paper. Cool. Uh, this paper has a really long appendix section. Let's see if there's anything interesting maybe that we can glean from here. ODEs. Okay, ImageNet images. So these are a little bit better. Uh, their sampler versus original sampler. This is higher FID, higher Frechet inception. So these technically are better according to Frechet inception. And actually more significantly is this. This is significantly faster. This is only 79 uh, inference steps of or 79 times you evaluated the denoiser. This is 250 times you evaluated the denoiser. So this is more than twice as fast. I would say the quality is kind of on par though. Uh, stochastic sampling with uh, their sampler and our sampler. So actually this is a lot Right, because the stochastic, you have to do that extra step. You're now evaluating a lot more the denoiser net. Yeah, this also goes to show you like how this Frechet inception distance is kind of a bogus metric. Like, you know, as a human, I can't really tell. Like, these seem like the same quality to me. It doesn't look like uh, these are higher or lower quality than these. You have some weird blowouts here. Improvements. Bunch of math, which is how they calculated the equations. Evaluating the ordinary differential equation. Right, the derivative, pull out the one over S of T. Heat equation, it's a lot of LaTeX. Uh, this is reframing, so taking previous methods and then just saying exactly what they did. Implementation details. OK, 
Okay, so it's actually an average. Two hundred million images, which is four hundred thousand training iterations with a batch size of five hundred twelve. It's kind of cool. Licenses for each of these. License status is unclear for ImageNet. Um, cool. Let's maybe look at the code a little bit here. NV Labs EDM. Let's look at the commits. It's still super early. All he did was just kind of put them in there, but. Uh, what's the dependencies? Docker file, image IO, image IO FFmpeg, pi, s, png. What is this? Pi, s, png is a small library for efficient loading png files into numpy arrays. Okay. I would have guessed that image IO has that. I don't know why you need the extra dependency there. Uh, PyTorch, NVIDIA, this is the PyTorch, SciPy, PyPillow, the Python image library. So this is all non-commercial, so don't use this for your startup. Use these ones, because these are MIT license. Cool. Uh, that's all I got for today. Kind of a dense paper, difficult to parse, but I think we learned a little bit more about diffusion models and kind of how they can be improved and how kind of the choice of the sampling uh, and the different kind of functions within uh, can be chosen to kind of be better. Kind of a toy data sets, toy problems, but I think this is all leading somewhere and I look forward to seeing NVIDIA's productization of diffusion-based generative models. All right, thank you guys.